All right. So, as I said, I'm Frank Quinn, Director of Preservation for Heritage Ohio. And I am excited to introduce our webinar today on the standards for rehabilitation, presented by Mary Angela Feaster of the State Historic Preservation Office. I am deep inside the concrete cube that you see if you drive up and down I-71 every day, uh, just north of downtown Columbus. It is tax credit season here. And Mary Angela has been uh, busily reviewing and making last minute um, phone calls and signings and getting everything ready for our latest round of tax credits, which will have an official announcement, I think in the next week or next couple weeks. Um, but today, Mary Angela is joining us to talk about the uh, standards for rehab, 10 common sense guidelines that uh, the SHPO uses to help evaluate the uh, suitability of work on historic buildings. So uh, without further ado, I am going to um, excuse myself from the seat, let Mary Angela take the seat and start her presentation. Oh, and uh, give her a chance to tell you all a little bit about herself. Good afternoon. I'm super pleased to be with you today, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. Um, I'll be delving into the standards in just a second. But um, to, uh, to follow what uh, Frank has asked me to do, um, I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction for myself. I'm Mary Angela Feaster. I'm department head and deputy state historic preservation officer for technical preservation services. Um, we do the review of federal and state tax credit program projects. Um, we also manage the CLG program. Um, any bricks and mortar grant or covenant comes through um, our office and to me to take a look at for conformance to the standards. We also work with the building doctor program. And if you have any technical questions, you know, how to repair your wood windows or how to do your repointing work, we are the people that um, handle those questions as well. Um, I have undergraduate degrees in, at, from Capital University in history, English, and secondary education. And my master's is in history from the Ohio State University. I've been with the State Historic Preservation Office in Columbus now. I'm going into my 35th year. Um, obviously believe very strongly in the mission of our um, office and the work that we do. The Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation actually is the guiding principle for all the work that we do. The standards have been in place now for decades. They are tried and true. And the benefit of us using the standards for all the reviews that we conduct, whether they are for tax credit projects, whether they're for grant projects, whether they're for section 106 review, the standards give a consistent line of guidance for all rehabilitation projects. And I'm gonna begin by actually doing a clarification of what is the difference between rehabilitation and what is restoration. Restoration is when you bring a building back to a particular period of time. So for example, if you have an 1870s Italianate building, um, that 1870s Italianate building, if it were to be restored, would not have plumbing, would not have heating and cooling, would not have those modern conveniences that you know, we live with. It's fine to do a restoration project. It's super noble to do a restoration project, but many people can't do restoration projects unless it's like for a museum level thing. What they do instead is rehabilitation. And as we go through the standards, you will see how a rehabilitation project preserves those characters and features that give the building its historic significance um, while bringing it into real up-to-date modern world standards and uh, being able to live and work in them. 
the standards are our guiding principles. As I mentioned just a moment ago, they are um, they cover every single thing that this office does. We have no other metric. We have no other set of standards. Anything that comes through the State Historic Preservation Office in Ohio or any State Historic Preservation Office must meet the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation. So the standards are applied to all guidance that we give across the country, and um, they're offered on the rehabilitation of historic buildings. There are a set of standards for restoration projects, but as I mentioned, primarily we deal with rehabilitation projects. But unless there is a governmental hook in your project, for example, you've applied for a federal grant or a state historic tax credit or a federal historic tax credit, the standards are only guiding principles and they're not required for the rehabilitation of historic buildings, even ones listed on the National Register of Historic Places. This is an important principle to uh, talk about for a second. Sometimes people think that National Register of Historic Places listing will tie the property owner's hands when it comes to doing any work he or she may want to do on their property. That is not the case unless you are inviting us in, that's the governmental hook aspect, unless you're inviting us in to the project because you want to secure a grant or you want to secure a federal tax credit or a state tax credit. In that case, the bargain is that in order to re um, receive that financial benefit, you must meet the Secretary of the Interior standards. What are the potential benefits of meeting the standards? Well, there are a lot of them. Um, first of all, eligibility for the federal and state historic tax credits, eligibility for federal grants, such as the COG grants that I mentioned, uh, federal undertaking compliance potential, that's the section 106 that I mentioned, not to mention the sensitive rehabilitation of your historic property. And you'll see as we go through the standards, it's all about material, and visual impact. That is our purview. That is what we are required to review this every project against. So what is the material impact on the historic fabric? What will the visual impact be at the end of the project? And then additional potential benefits from um, the Ohio History Connection and the State Historic Preservation Office for projects that meet the standards, um, such as the Paul Broon grants, would fall into that category. So questions of integrity and how the standards can help preserve integrity. This is all about, does the property still maintain what made it significant? Um, again, this is a rehabilitation pro program. So it isn't that you have to retain every single thing exactly as it was in the 1870s for that Italian aid building. Rather, are you retaining those features that give that 1870s Italianate its historic significance while still bringing the project up to the standards that you need to be able to live and work in it? So you're going to evaluate the essential physical features of the property. Material integrity cannot be faked or recreated. Um, once it's gone, once historic integrity is gone, it's gone. You can replicate it, but it isn't historic. It is historic looking. And we're gonna be talking about that when we get to standard six. Meeting the standards and rehabilitation projects really helps preserve the material, the historic, the visual integrity of the property. The standards look at material and visual impact. That's it. We are, if you, so if, if there's something that we can't see that you have to do, let's say it's something structural and your building has to have some sort of structural upgrade and it doesn't adversely impact the historic material and it has no visual impact, you cannot see it at all, then the standards don't apply because we are looking at impact on the historic material and overall visual impact. This last point on this slide is super important. The standards do not, cannot compel an applicant to take an action. Only if an action is taken 
must that action then be in conformance with the standards? What do I mean by that? Let me explain. Let's say you inherited a building that has a dropped acoustic ceiling that is so low it falls below window heads. That is inappropriate. That would not meet the standards. That's not compatible. However, you inherited that feature. So you don't have to take any action with that feature. You can leave that drop ceiling just as it is because you did not do it. But let's say you don't like that drop ceiling or the drop ceiling is really deteriorated and you remove that drop ceiling. Well, then all bets are off. Then you must do what the next ceiling is would meet the standards. And in the case of the ceiling example, we would recommend um, either repairing the plaster that is likely there, or if there's a decorative metal ceiling, obviously retaining and expressing and repairing that as needed. Um, but let's say your ceilings are gone. Let's just say um, you can put up a drywall ceiling and you can do it compatibly. You would do it at historic heights or just a little bit below if you need to get some mechanicals up there, but definitely above your window heads. So this is an example, again, of you don't have to take an action, but if you choose to take an action, then that action must be in conformance to the standards. So this is entitled Material Integrity Unmasked. This is such a handsome building um, that they just were trying to modernize, you know, and, and try to compete with the mall down the street. And so they put this skin on it. Fortunately for this building, the things that lend it its historic significance visually were all still underneath the skin. So now we're gonna be working with the standards. All kinds of buildings, um, the standards work with all kinds of buildings, regardless of whether it's governmental buildings or private buildings or commercial buildings, the standards apply across the board. And as I mentioned earlier in the, in the presentation this, today, the standards are decades old. And so they've really uh, held true and, sh and uh, survived quite well the test of time. The standards consider historic character um, in and with all of the following, the environment, the shape of the building, the site, the structure, the spaces in the building, size, scale, materials, details, and craftsmanship. And as Frank mentioned at the beginning, um, and it's very true, the standards for rehabilitation are 10 common sense principles that uh, focus on the preservation of historic character, repair versus replacement, we're gonna be talking a bit about that, and compatibility. And as I said just a moment ago in the example of all the buildings that I showed you, they apply to all types of buildings. And interestingly enough, they pertain to both interiors and exteriors. When we do uh, federal and state tax credit reviews, when I do a grant review, things like that, um, when we're looking at a federal tax credit project, we look at both the exterior work that's proposed as well as the interior work. So the standards apply to both inside and outside of buildings. So here we launch into standard one. A property shall be used for its historic purpose or be placed in a new use that requires minimal change to the defining characteristics of the building and its site and environment. When you shift this down into what this means, it means compatible new use. So you're shifting it down to is the use that you are proposing for the building compatible? So for example, if you have a um, large open ballroom space that is a significant ballroom space, it's highly articulated, it's like the primary space in the building, and you need to get 18 units in that ballroom space in order to make the building work for what you need it to work for that would likely not be considered a compatible new use. You may need to do it to get your new use, but it isn't a compatible use for that significant uh, space. 
This, however, is a compatible new use. So obviously this is a historic school and you can see on the right what the classroom looked like pre-rehabilitation. My gosh, they even had their historic chalkboards remaining and their decorative metal ceilings and the open volume of space. And after on the left-hand side, um, they retained their volume of space. They were sensitive with their HVAC work. You can see uh, the line that's running through there, but doesn't obscure the decorative metal ceiling. Um, and then the chalkboard. The one caveat on this one is the park service is really encouraging more respect of historic flooring. And as you can see on the right, that historic wood floor is in very nice and good condition. So that would be um, asked to be retained in the rehab and expressed. So again, it's all about compatible new use. And this is an example of a compatible new use. The storefronts are still reading as storefronts, whether they're used as you know, commercial storefronts or not, that's really not, you know, that's up to the, the property owner. It's just if it looks like it is a compatible new use. And this clearly does. Standard two asks us uh, to uh, make sure that the historic character of the pro property shall be retained and preserved. The removal of historic materials or alterations of features and spaces that characterize a property shall be avoided. This is very, very basic tenant of, of the standards. You need to preserve in your rehabilitation project, what gives the building its historic character. Um, and I think all people who love historic buildings want to retain historic character. And that's what standard two is all about. Um, what you see are um, Cincinnati over the Rhine. This is a building um, on the left pre-rehabilitation and then on the right after rehabilitation. Again, you can see the sensitive repair rehabilitation of the storefronts. They removed the brick um, bulkheads, which were not um, those, those lower portions below the storefront. Those were not brick historically. They were um, likely wood and they returned them. The dormers remain, the chimneys remain, the two over two windows remain, the cornice line remains. All of those things that lend this building its historic character were retained in this rehabilitation. And this is an example of an interior. Um, this is super um, you, significant in that it has borrowed light windows and doors with glass in them and transoms. And it is possible to meet code and retain your, um, your borrowed light glass. And this, this clearly is significant and historic and you can see it on the right-hand side from the inside um, looking out and all retained in the successful rehabilitation and all meet standard two because this is certainly a character defining feature of this building on the interior. So again, it's exteriors and interiors are looked at with the standards. Standard three asks us to recognize each property um, as a physical record of its time, its place, and its use. Changes that create a false sense of history, um, such as adding conjectural features or architectural elements taken from another building shall not be undertaken. Let me give you an example of that. This is the Sycamore Cafe uh, here in German Village in Columbus. And on the left, you can see it has really survived the test of time, except for those kick plates, the bulkheads underneath the storefront, which are brick and probably weren't brick. Otherwise, the uh, storefront windows have been retained, the transoms, um, you've got nicely decorative um, uh, lintels and sills, and all of that has survived. On the right-hand building, however, which looked very much like the Sycamore Cafe on the left, you have what we euphemistically call here in the office a phony colonial kind of appearance. They've tried to take this building back to a false history, a, a history that it never ever would have had. So this would be a violation of standard three. There is absolutely no false history there, 
Um, you've got a building that has retained a, on the exterior um, many super significant historic features um, that were there historically within the period of significance and have been retained in the rehabilitation. Standard four tells us this, this one is probably the standard that I, I take the, I have to uh, spend the most time explaining because it's challenging. I, I get it. Most properties change over time. Those changes that have acquired historic significance in their own right shall be retained and preserved. And you would be right in thinking, well, Mary Angela, you just got finished telling me that, you know, everything needs to be compatible and you, and you retain the things that make the building um, part of its time that it was constructed. Um, and I get that. I, I completely understand that because no one would likely say that this highly articulated um, deco storefront is compatible to this little Italian aid building. I, I don't think anyone could argue that it, it is. However, standard four would say that this highly articulated, highly significant, high level of craftsmanship deco storefront has gained significance in its own right. And as a result of the fact, because of the finishes and the high level of craftsmanship that this storefront has, even though it's not compatible with the rest of this uh, little Italian aid building, standard four would say that that um, significant deco storefront would need to be retained. And if you have any questions about that, um, I'd be happy to answer, try to answer them more at the end, because this one is, is a bit of a bear to understand. But again, super significant storefront added that has gained significance in its own right. Standard five asks us to retain distinctive finishes, features, and construction techniques. Again, level of craftsmanship that characterize a property shall be preserved. And this is the old Holzer Hospital. You can see this very articulated high level of craftsmanship. Uh, yes, it needed some work. You can see in the image to the right, it absolutely needed some work. But I mean, look at those capitals, those printing capitals. Look at um, the detail, the fluting in the columns and the porch railing and all of the dental details and all of that beautiful craftsmanship has all been retained in the rehabilitation on the image on the left. This is Washington High School. This was a rehabilitation project of mine. Extremely significant main entry, all preserved after rehabilitation. So again, interiors and exteriors equally looked at. This is, you can see the marble, you can see the wood door details, um, the decoration at the ceiling, all of this was preserved. This is the Netherlands Hotel in Cincinnati. Again, a super significant, highly articulated, um, a highly detailed space, all of which was preserved. Okay, so standard six, I call standard six the mother of all standards. And I should have said earlier that the mother of our entire program really is the National Register of Historic Places. In order to qualify for many of the things that we do, particularly, for example, the federal historic tax credits, you must eventually be listed on the National Register of Historic Places to be given final certification for the federal tax credits. So the National Register is sort of the mother of all of the programs that we work with. I say that I, standard six, all the standards are important. Um, we review holistically, we look at the entire project, but if you are interested in a, for example, federal um, tax credit project, you must conform to all of the standards. Standard one about compatible new use, there's a reason why it's the first standard, um, but it's also extremely important because it talks about retention of historic fabric versus replacement. So imagine that same 1870s Italian aid building that I've been talking about. Let's say um, an applicant says, you know, the columns, um, I'm sorry, the um, brackets that at the cornice are in really need of re repair, but that's going to be hard. So we're just going to replace them. They'll, they'll look exactly the same, but we're going to replace them. 
And the windows, yep, the windows work and they're in fair condition, but they also need some work. And it's just gonna be easier for us to replace those windows, even though we could repair them and we could put a storm on there to get the energy efficiency that, that we need. Um, it's just gonna be easier for us to re replace them rather than repair them. It's gonna be easier for us to replace them, but they'll look exactly the same. And our interior wood floors, they're a little bit warped. Yeah, we could, we could repair them. We could do a little bit of, of selective replacement, but it's just gonna be easier for us to um, go over those with a modern floor. So I could go on and on. I think you see the point that I'm making. What you're left with then is a historic looking building versus an actual historic building. So standard six really directs us to retain historic features and repair them rather than replace them. However, the standards are very reasonable. Uh, Frank and I have both said they are common sense and they really are. When you have a feature that is damaged beyond reasonable repair, you can document that and you can replace to match if it's a distinctive feature, like, for example, um, an existing, bra existing brackets at a cornice. The new feature would need to match the old in design, color, texture, and visual qualities. Remember, I talked at the beginning about we look at visual impact and where possible materials. Why do I say where possible? Well, we want you to retain the historic material whenever you can, right? Because we, the standards look at material impact on the historic fabric. But if you've demonstrated that the feature is significant but beyond reasonable repair, then really, while it'd be great if you could replace it with the same material, if it looks the same, that's the visual impact I was talking about, if it looks the same, then it will likely meet standard six. Um, so I had mentioned that you have to document um, deterioration. You also need to document replacement of missing features. You have to document them, substantiate them um, with documentary, physical, or pictorial evidence, because that goes back to not wanting to add conjecture, not wanting to add a feature, a historic feature that never really was on the building. So if you say, well, you know, this was on the building, but it's missing, and we want to add it back then we would say, and it's a distinctive feature, then we would say, okay, yes, we, we would absolutely be, be happy to talk with you about that, but you'll need to document that that feature was actually on this particular building. And it doesn't work to show that it was on a building in another city, wherever it has to be on the building, the subject building that you're working with to avoid that conjecture and, and be true to the building. So this is just an example on the left of siding being selectively replaced. Some of the siding was legitimately damaged beyond reasonable repair. And there's, you know, that's not everything is forever. And so uh, older materials certainly last a lot longer, but they eventually have a life that need and they need to be um, replaced. And so um, this project, they selectively replaced the siding that needed to be replaced while retaining the historic siding that was able to be retained and then repainted. Um, on the interior here, you see um, they had historic doors that needed some work. There's no question about it, as did the transoms above, but they were able to retain them versus replacing them. These are examples, again, we try to give exterior and interior examples. So obviously siding is a significant feature of any building, this wood, historic wood siding, very significant. So character defining needs to be kept. On the interior, this is a door to the corridor. This is a transom to the corridor. So again, a distinctive significant feature that should be uh, retained and repaired and they were able to successfully do that. This is at Fort Hayes. And this is very interesting because the upper image that I'm showing you is before, and the bottom image I'm showing you is after of these same windows. So they were able to, through the use of some replacement, no question, obviously they've got, they've got an upper sash that's missing. They had to do some replacement, but they were able to, through the use of some epoxy, through some Dutchman, and then as I said, selective replacement, they were able to repair these historic windows. So even these kinds of dire situations were able 
to be successfully repaired. I really like this example um, because it shows you an upper sash that is historic and retained and a lower sash that had to be replaced. It was just damaged beyond reasonable repair. Generally, lower sashes um, take more abuse than upper ones because they're the ones that more typically are raised up and down. So they get a little bit more wear and tear. But this property owner was just committed to retaining all of the historic elements of the window that they could. They just could not keep this lower sash. So what did they do? They um, ret retained the upper sash, which was repairable. And then they replaced, they milled to match, even with lugs, the lower sash. So this is a great example of trying to keep your historic fabric where you, it was repairable and then having to replace, but because windows are very distinctive in a building, they replaced to match. Standard seven is our do no harm standard. Um, the chemical, physical treatments such as sandblasting or air blasting or soda bacon, uh, baking blasting, any kind of damage to historic material shall not be used. Uh, the surface cleaning of structures, if appropriate, shall be undertaken using the gentlest means. So if you have historic masonry, for example, that is um, has got some patina on it, like this one on the lower left, you've got some patina on that brick. If it isn't doing any damage, then we would suggest, eh, just leave it. You know, you'll save yourself money. It's not doing any damage to the masonry. You, sh you for sure aren't gonna do any damage in the cleaning process because you aren't touching it, right? But let's say that really bothers you. You really would like to clean that masonry, even though it isn't doing any damage, you just want to clean it. Well, what you could do is you could take, for example, a natural bristle brush, non-ionic detergent, and scrub off the dirt, definitely elbow grease, but boy, there's no runoff. You don't, uh, there's runoff, but it's clean runoff. There's no mitigation that needs to be done because you're basically using, you know, like non-ionic dishwashing liquid and, you know, uh, water and, and there's, so there's no hazard at all there. Um, and then you rinse with garden hose pressure pointing down. So you don't kind of run up into the, the joints or anything. And you've got a cleaner building with zero abrasion. The upper photo wasn't so lucky. Um, this was a painted building. The applicant did not want to have it painted any longer. Um, and so they sandblasted it. And as you can see, it took off the face of the brick. Um, it took off the hard outer coating and exposed the soft inner, be inner belly of the brick. And that brick is going to absorb water much more readily than if it had its nice hard surface on that was removed in the sandblasting. And that will expose it to the freeze thaw cycle. And it's just going to continue with deterioration. And unfortunately, when something like this is done, there is no remediation. It, it's, I mean, the surface of the brick has, has been compromised. So, um, and look at that, they weren't able to take off all of the paint anyway. So now you kind of have a splotched appearance and I would be remiss if I didn't say, and those mortar joints are much too wide for this brick and they look like they're super hard Portland, which um, is not a compatible mortar for, um, for, uh, for especially historic brick um, because it will cause compression. And so you've got the freeze thaw, You've got the compression that's going on. So the, this poor brick um, is gonna have a time of it. Whereas the lower left brick um, is as pristine and will last a very, very long time. And I talked to you about the non-ionic detergent, nat natural bristle brush, and you probably thought, oh, that's not really gonna do a great job at getting off stuff. It really does. It really does a really fine job at getting off um, a lot of the dirt and grime um, and you notice the gentleman is in a suit to protect him from water, but he's not wearing any kind of mask or anything like that because this is just basically dishwashing liquid and water. Standard eight is our archeological standard. Um, and it says that significant archeological resources affected by a project shall be protected and preserved. And if such resources must be disturbed, mitigation measures shall be undertaken. Um, I, as I said, have been um, working for the SHPO for over three decades now. And the one project 
um, the only project that um, I have had experience in using standard aid, and it was so interesting, was Cincinnati Music Hall. And it was a tax credit project, both state and federal. And they were working on um, an orchestra pit where they had some musicians. And so um, they, um, they were digging and um, they found that, um, they found human remains in this orchestra pit. And um, they obviously stopped the project immediately. Standard eight came into play. The human remains were uh, carefully and respectfully um, removed and taken to an appropriate location. But standard eight protected uh, those human remains uh, that were found um, in the orchestra pit during the course of rehabilitation. So uh, taken very, very seriously, that entire project stopped as it should uh, to, to manage those uh, remains respectfully. And this is an example of uh, very significant archeological resources. As, as you may know, our office deals with both above ground and below ground historic and prehistoric uh, resources, as you can see in this image. And you can find a wealth of information from um, archaeological uh, resources. This is a cistern, and it was underneath um, a brick walkway that was underneath an asphalt parking lot, and it was uncovered as part of the rehabilitation project. And the images that you see on the left are all items that were recovered from the cistern. So it just, archeological finds like this just give you a whole new world into the history of how buildings um, were, were used and that's historic archeology. span And then there is a bunch of information obviously that can be discovered with prehistoric archeology. span Standard nines um, tells us that new additions or exterior alterations or related new construction shall not destroy Historic materials, again, we're back to focusing on historic materials, like always, that characterize the property. The new work shall be differentiated from the old and shall be compatible with the massing, the size, the scale, and the architectural features to protect the historic integrity of the property and its environment. So this is a project of mine um, that in the Cincinnati area where they had to install because uh, this was going to be um, senior housing and they had to install an elevator. So what did they do? They chose a very discreet location. They chose materials that were compatible to the historic masonry. Um, they chose a color that was compatible, but literally from the primary elevation or from any really street at all, this is um, tucked away and um, and hidden. You would not think that this building, you would not be fooled into thinking that this building was original, right? It's, it's very com uh, contemporary, but it is compatible, both in its location and its size and its materials. This one is also a really good example of that. Um, they needed to introduce um, handicapped accessibility. And so they introduced a ramp on this uh, side elevation, very minimal. Um, you can see it from the front, certainly, but the impact is very minimal and your eye goes to the historic building. It's very compatible. And then the final standard that we're gonna talk about today are that new additions and adjacent or related new construction shall be undertaken in a manner that if it's removed in the future, um, the integrity of the property, the form um, will be, and the environment would be unimpaired. So um, again, you know, you've heard me talk during this entire presentation about material and visual impact. Well, again, we don't want to have an adverse effect on the historic material. So additions um, or anything new, any new construction, anything new that you do um, should be able to be removed by historians in the future with no adverse effect to the historic building. So that is standard 10. Um, this is the Columbus Metropolitan Library, and they had to create an air, airlock, an air vestibule, because what you see are the historic doors there, 
that would just open right up into um, this lobby space of the library. And that didn't work so well for heating and cooling. So they created this really simple, highly glassed uh, vestibule airlock that can be popped out without any damage to the significant floor or the ceiling above. So this clearly meets standard 10. But just because something is reversible does not mean that you can't, you don't have to meet the rest of the standards. You still have to meet the rest of the standards and the new stuff has to be able to be reversed. So I mentioned that there were a lot of pluses in um, meeting the standards. And one is the 20% federal um, rehabilitation tax credit. Um, again, it has to be a certified structure listed on the National Register or in um, either individually or in a district as a contributing resource. Um, it's 20%. The project is reviewed by the SHPO and it's approved by the National Park Service. And it's a joint program between the Park Service and the IRS. And again, the only metric with respect to the SHPO and Park Service review is that the work must meet the standards. And then another big benefit if you wanna meet the standards and you qualify with your building is the 25% Ohio Historic Preservation Tax Credits. Again, uh, the qualification is that you must meet the standards. That is a joint program between um, our office and the Ohio Development Services Agency. So this is um, our department, Technical Preservation Services. We are um, part of the State Historic Preservation Office, which is part of the Ohio History Connection. Um, if you are interested in tax credits, our first point of contact for that is Nathan Bevel, and I've given you Nathan's email address. Um, but if you have any questions about the standards themselves, anyone in our office would be very, very glad to answer them for you. Again, I really appreciate the opportunity that Heritage Ohio has given me this afternoon to, to walk you through the standards um, and talk with, talk with you a little bit about how they can certainly be met in your rehabilitation project. And now, Frank, I'd be happy to answer any questions that folks may have. Great, and Mary Angela, it is always our pleasure uh, and our uh, great fortune when you join us on these webinars because you are the the authority, the <laughs> expert in Ohio. And so, yeah, we are um, open for questions and we're already getting a couple questions in. Have one question from Jess and Jess, I know I owe you an email reply back on a related manner. So I will get back with you just as soon as possible. But Jess asks a uh, question for standard six. When is this historic structure has had historic elements, let's say windows removed and replaced with contemporary materials prior to National Register listing, but retained or partially retained on site. What does compliance with standard six look like? And I think what that's the case when maybe you're in the basement or the attic and the building owner is like, well, they took all the windows out 50 years ago, but they put them up here in storage and they look great, other than the fact that they're probably caked with uh, 50 layers of dust. That's really an excellent question. Um, and, and thank you, Frank, for your very kind comments, by the way. And that's really an excellent question. And we would definitely encourage you um, to put the historic windows back. If you are fortunate enough that they left those historic windows in place, first of all, hooray for you. That's really lucky for you. Um, because you're never going to find windows, even good replacement windows, that are going to fit unless you go to like a rough masonry opening installation, which is also going to be a challenge to do anyway, um, especially if you have a historic trim on the inside. Um, we would encourage you to repair and reinstall the historic windows. Um, let's take that same example, though, and let's say that your windows were, were replaced, let's say, like in you know, the 1970s or something. And, but you have historic documentation, you have a historic photograph that shows you, well, you know what, this building had two over two windows and I'd like to go back to two over two windows. Well, you have that historic documentation and as part of a, you know, like a federal tax credit project, let's say, you would be able to return those two over two windows um, to that elevation because you have the historic documentation. The same with any kind of historic feature that might be missing. Again, if you have the documentation that shows that it was there, you absolutely, um, you don't have to, 
but you absolutely could um, could put that back if you wish. So further along the topic of historic windows, uh, especially when it comes to tax credit projects, what are the common efforts that you've seen to undertake improvements to energy efficiency when historic single pane windows are retained? That is an also a really good question because, you know, so critical right now, everything that we are hearing about climate change. And actually, I would say that historic preservation has been on the front end of climate change for many, many decades because there is nothing more environmentally sound than retaining the historic building that you have and reusing it and repairing it. So um, there have been studies done that show that if you, if you have um, a single pane glass window, first of all, there are some single pane glass window projects that actually retrofit with um, insulated glass. So number one, you can do that, you can do that too. I tend to have a personal liking for storms. Now, some people, you know, think, well, the storms block the visuals of the historic windows, but not if they're done well. Like if you've got your styles and your rails, your top and your bottom rail and your meeting rail, if all of those align with the historic window, then you can still read the historic window behind. Um, and really, honestly, um, interior storms are just as acceptable as exterior storms. I tend to like exterior storms a little better, only personal preference, because I feel they lend a little bit of added protection to the historic window. But studies have shown that you can get at or very near the same kind of energy conservation as you can with a storm. Let me tell you something else, though. I really am all about climate moderation. You know, we need to save <laughs> the planet for future generations. Um, and as a mother of three, I am all about doing that. At the same time, what we've experienced for the last nearly two years now tells us that fresh air ventilation is also critically important. We have preached for a very, very, very long time that buildings that breathe are better for the building and better for the occupants of the building. And one thing again, that I think everyone can agree on is that buildings that breathe, um, what we've seen over the last two years, um, it's better for the people inside the buildings, that fresh air circulation, but it can be done in a way that is also cognizant uh, and respectful to energy conservation. Great, that's good to hear. Got a question across all of the standards for buildings that retain both many or the majority of elements from their original construction, but features that strongly evoke other eras in parts of the interior or exterior. Uh, how does SHPO like to see um, those different elements resolved? Is it okay to retain all those different pieces um, if it's true to the building's long history of use? And the asker says, I'm working on um, a 1890s Italian ape, but some storefronts were redone in mid-century modern in the 1950s. And as in your Art Deco example in the slides, they have gained significance in their own right. So we just retain as much of each part as we can, true to the materials and uses of its era. Again, very insightful question, very good question. So first of all, you're referring to standard four and absolutely, if it's a high level of craftsmanship, we would encourage its retention. Let me caveat that though. When you have a historic district, you're gonna have a period of significance or, or even for an individual nomination, you're gonna have a period of significance. And let's say, for that modern storefront, let's say that you are in a historic district and your period of significance ends in 1910. Let's just say that. The standard, standard four, would encourage you to retain that modern storefront because it's retained significance in its own right, but you have documentation that shows the 1910 storefront and the period of significance ends in 1910. 
if you wanted to, you wouldn't have to, because remember the standards don't compel you to take an action, but if you wanted to, the standards would allow you to remove that modern storefront to return a 1910 storefront for which you had pictorial documentation. But the history of a building is not static. Buildings, you know, we are only the caretakers for a short period of time. And so buildings absolutely do change and evolve. The trick is to identify those features that are truly significant. What I mean by that is, let's say that same 1870s Italian 8 building that I was talking about earlier. Let's say on the rear, it had a um, bathroom, a little tiny bathroom addition that was added so, um, so that, you know, to bring it up to modern times. It's on the rear. It's, yeah, it, it talks about how the building was used historically, but you know, every, every building that was continued as, as habitable use had a bathroom added. So is it really that significant to the history of the building and it's kind of deteriorated and you want to get rid of it again? The standards would not compel you to take an action. But if you said, you know what, this is damage beyond reasonable repair, it really doesn't speak really to the significance of the building, that absolutely, that little uh, bathroom addition could go. So there's a distinction there. You know, it's showing the, the evolution of the building, that it got modern plumbing, at least in this little addition, but that is not so significant that it can't, it can't go away, it can't be changed. But let's say, you have um, the modern storefront and your period of significance ends in 1960. And it's painful for me to say, given, given my age, that there are buildings that are now significant well beyond that. I mean, there are buildings that are significant when I graduated from college, for heaven's sakes, but that's the way that it is. And um, those features that are within the period of significance um, are can then um, be if they're significant, they can be said, yeah, you should retain those features. They've gained significance in their own right, just like the example that I showed you of the little deco storefront. So taking your example of the modern storefront, if the period of significance, if you want to keep it period, all more power to you, terrific. But if you have to have a justification for it, and let's say the period of significance ends, like I said, in the 1960s or something, then obviously that modern storefront is significant, beyond is historic beyond just being significant and should be retained and would be required to be retained if it were a federal historic tax credit project. All right. So um, looking at, I think it was standard two, you had a visual that showed a masonry wall with heavily worn paint on it. And your after of that shot showed that the masonry had been repainted. Are there basic guidelines when dealing with unpainted brick or a brick that was once painted but has been flaking off for years or generations? Yes, that is that is a that is a basic tenant that we advise people and we get this directly from the park service. Unpainted whether it's inside or out should remain unpainted. Painted historically painted inside or out should be his, should be repainted. Um, so taking the example of the flaking paint, again, standards are super flexible. The standards cannot compel you to repaint. Um, now, if you touch, if you like try to remove all of the paint, that's considered a touch. Remember, you've taken an action now, and then you have to bring that project into conformance. And if it was painted historically, then it should be repainted. But let's say you can prove that that paint was not historic. Let's say that paint was added after the period of significance. And you can demonstrate that you can remove that paint without damage. So now I've got a couple standards that I'm pulling in, right? Um, if you can show that that building was not painted historically and you don't want it to be painted and you can demonstrate that you can remove that paint without damage, which is a tough, tough thing for masonry because the masonry can soak in that paint then um, you can, you can remove the paint if you wish. But the path of least resistance for a building that was painted historically is either to let it continue to weather if you don't wanna repaint it or better yet, repaint it because it was, it was painted historically and that's part of its history. All right, um, looking at standards nine and 10, do these standards apply to full sites or does it depend on how a property is listed? For example, if a nature center 
as a historic building that's listed on the National Register, but the Nature Center wants to build a modern contemporary style interpretive educational center. Is that okay? Um, and then if they're using tax credit incentives, is that okay? But then of course the additional construction is not eligible for tax credits. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. You cannot get, you can't count the QREs uh, you can't count new construction into your qualified rehabilitation expenditures, your QREs. That's absolutely true. And beyond that, I'm really not permitted to talk about cost very much because that's then an IRS question. But we could, if you wished and you let me know afterwards, I can send you the IRS contact for the federal tax credit program. But that's absolutely true. With respect to is the design okay? Would the new addition be okay? It's all about the design. Um, we would want that new addition to be compatible to the historic building and the site and environment. That's why the standards cover this, uh, not just the building itself, but also the historic site and environment. So I couldn't really answer your question without looking at the design, but certainly we've had new construction on a myriad of projects through the years that absolutely meet the standards, are reversible, are compatible, um, and then there are some that aren't, but yeah, we absolutely be willing to work with you on getting a project that uh, could conform to the standards. And when you work with us, first of all, everything we do is free. Um, and so if you brought a proposal to us, we're not allowed to design projects, but if you brought a proposal to us and say, hey, could you give me some guidance on whether this conforms to the standards or not? We are certainly, um, wel we would absolutely welcome the opportunity to do that. Um, but let's say for a tax credit project, um, again, you have a certain program that you need to meet, you have a certain thing that you need to have happen, you mentioned tax credits, then um, you could bring a design to us and we can let you know whether we think that it will work or whether we think we would, could suggest a change, even though we're not allowed to design, we don't do that, but we could suggest a change because the only skin that we have in the game of tax credit projects is to get you your approval at the end of the day. And Ohio has a pretty solid reputation. Um, Ohio projects that go into um, the National Park Service Review are seldomly, if ever, changed, like at all. Um, so we work really hard to make that happen because we don't want to approve something that then you find out two or three months later the Park Service is going to deny. That does no one any good. And also, we have a lot of experience in Ohio. We just got our numbers at the end of last week for fiscal year 2021 in the eight categories that the National Park Service records for federal tax credit projects in their annual report. And this is the draft report. The final report will come out um, after the first of the year, but I'm told that there are little changes in the numbers. In six of the eight categories, Ohio ranks in the top five across the country. In one category, we are number three, and in the other five, we are number two in the country for the number of rehabilitation projects that we do in our QREs and all of that. Um, we are second in number to New York, and as far as QREs, we are second to Texas. We are not the most populous state in the country. We do not have the most buildings of anyone in the country, but to rank number two in five of the eight and to rank in the top five in six of the eight categories across the country, that means Ohio and their owners and um, uh, SHPO were doing a lot of work together to get these terrific historic buildings rehabbed. And again, our job is to help you meet the standards. And for tax credits, the program is super simple. You apply for the, the um, program, you apply for the federal credits, you present a project to us, we work with you to bring that project into conformance to the Secretary of the Interior Standards, remember the only metric we're allowed to use. We send that project forward to the National Park Service with our recommendation. The Park Service makes the decision of approval and then you just complete the project as you received approval for. Honestly, it's that easy. You propose something, we work with you to get it approved in conformance with the standards, you do the work that you received approval for. Great, uh, and if you think about it on a population basis, we probably are number one in all those categories, aren't we? <laughs> we are number one no matter what, Fred. Get your phone fingers out and wave them high in the air, okay? 
All right, so question, how would you recommend the city deal with owners of 19th century buildings who are pushing for the removal of the existing slash original siting so that they can wrap the building in order to be, uh, in order for the building to improve efficiency. And it's a replacing wood clapboard with new wood clapboard. Well, that would not meet the standards um, with especially standard six um, with retention of repairable historic fabric. Um, fortunately, um, I don't have a lot of experience with that. We don't get tax credit projects in that tax credit reviews are my bread and butter um, for my job. And so we don't, we haven't gotten a lot of projects that are doing that. So. Um, I'm afraid I don't know how to answer that question. However, Nathan Bevel, whose contact information I gave you, and I'm going to put that back up again on the screen, um, he manages our certified local government program, and he likely has much more experience with that kind of thing than I do. So I would encourage you to send Nathan an email to ask him what experience he has, um, because that certainly isn't something that would be recommended under the standards. All right, a couple of quick questions, and then I think we'll wrap up. We're just a little bit after four o'clock. I have a question. What about ADA accessibility? If there are elevators required, like in the example of the senior housing, does that count as part of the QREs if it's required for the new use? That is such a good question, and no, if it's outside the building, and yes, if it's inside the building. So if it's within the historic building envelope, yes. If not, no. And that is also an IRS question. And again, you can either contact me, Nathan can also pass along the IRS contact, they would be able to tell you. And in fact, she told us recently in a meeting that they get a lot of questions on what counts as a QRE and what doesn't. And I know that they're working on um, being able to have some sort of pamphlet or some information that they can pass out, but she could answer that question. But easily, the easy answer, the, the uh, historian answer versus the IRS answer to that is, if it's the out, outside of the building envelope, no. If it's inside the building envelope, yes. And uh, finally, question when running uh, new HVAC duct lines in uh, commercial spaces that are being rehabilitated, what? how do you deal with running the ducts? Do you try to do ultra small ducts and hide them in chases? Do you do full-size ducts uh, unpainted? Do you do full-size ducts and try to camouflage them? Are there some basic guidelines? Yes, there are. That's an excellent, excellent question. And I really appreciate it. Excellent question. So it depends on the building that you have. If you have a manufacturing industrial type building, then maybe it's gonna be appropriate to have some exposed duct work. But regardless, the Park Service absolutely recommends that you finish it so that it doesn't I use the term so it doesn't scream out at you. So if you have shiny um, ductwork, you know, that's screaming out at you, even in an industrial type building, maybe soften that up a little bit. So it sort of kind of disappears into the ceiling. But let's say you have a finished space, right? You have a um, commercial space that was always finished. We are finding, and we really work with applicants to do this, that there is often sufficient plenum space above your ceilings to get that duct work in. There are, there is, there are cavities in your walls to get those plumbing, those sanitary lines in that you need to. But let's say you just can't. Let's say your historic ceilings are right at your window heads. And let's say you have a small commercial space such that you can't like set back a ceiling like 10 or, 10 or 12 feet back. Let's just say it's not doable because your space is so little. What we are seeing more and more projects use are those flat um, duct, the flat, well, well, we're seeing a lot of people use systems that are um, the cassette systems that just mount to a wall and they don't need any duct work, they just need some condensate lines. Um, we are seeing an explosion in popularity of those. So a lot of people are using those. But we're also seeing duct work that is flat against the ceiling. And so it has a much less pronounced profile, those are always painted out when they have to be, when they're in a finished space and they, you have no option but to have a little bit of an exposed run. But it all depends on how much has to be exposed, how visible is that exposure going to be, 
Can it really not be concealed somewhere else? Again, what is the historic use of the building and what is appropriate? So all of those things come into play. But yes, we do have some, we have a standard mechanical condition that we place um, on often on tax credit projects. Um, so if you have an example of what you're working with and you know the plenum space that you have above your ceiling and you know the cavity space that you have in your wall um, and you have the history of the building, which I'm sure that you do, uh, we are not mechanical engineers. We can't do the design, but what we can do is we can give you a reaction to whether the work that you're proposing conforms to the standards. All right, great. I never fail to learn something new every time <laughs> I sit in on one of these webinars. And I think because also it's it's an ever-changing landscape. There's always tweaks Absolutely. and you know, new, new and better ways of preserving your historic resources. And all in conformance with the standards, Frank. Exactly, exactly. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. I'd like to thank Mary Angela for presenting and um, everyone who attended today's webinar will get a link to the recording sent to them in a couple days. This webinar, along with countless others, are on our YouTube channel. You can go to youtube.com, type in Heritage Ohio, and access our channel and check out webinars. Um, otherwise, you know, everyone have a great rest of your day. Enjoy the coming of winter, right? And, and stay tuned for the tax credit announcement happening very soon, later this month. All right, see ya. Bye, Bye. thank you.